Are you ready to start our day? I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rachel Lambert and Sarah Lev, who will be presenting on access to meaningful mathematics for students with disabilities in early childhood. In their presentation, they will explore equity for students with disabilities through meaningful mathematics. Dr. Lambert will share the negative repercussions of deficit conceptions. They will present a model for universal design for learning, highlighting a project-based learning unit for Ms. Lev's transitional kindergarten classroom. We are excited to have them push our thinking on this vitally important issue. Please welcome Dr. Lambert and Ms. Lev to your screens. Hello. Hello, my name is Rachel Lambert and I'm here with Sarah Lev and we are so excited to be presenting today. Um, our presentation is called Access to Meaningful Mathematics for Students with Disabilities in Early Childhood. And I'm really excited to be presenting here from my child's bedroom because it has the best internet connection. Um, mm -hmm. my, uh, my name, as I said, is Rachel Lambert. I was a special and a general education teacher for over 10 years in New York City and California. And um, now I'm a professor of math education and special education at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And um, at the bottom of the page, you can see uh, links to my Twitter account. Every slide that we're going to show today for Sarah or myself has our Twitter handle. So you can ask questions in the feed, but you can also ask, you can also ask us questions on Twitter and we can have sort of a slow chat about anything that sort of develops here today. Um, and my website has a lot of my research. My research is generally about identity development of students with color with dis students of color with disabilities and sort of critical analysis of the fields of special education and math education. That's what I work on in my research. And um, now I want to introduce you to Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Lev. I'm a transitional kindergarten teacher in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm also a member of the National Faculty of PBL Works. It used to be called the Buck Institute for Education. And PBL Works is an organization that supports teachers and school leaders in providing really wonderful professional development in project-based learning. And um, I'm also the co-author of a new book called um, Implementing Project-Based Learning in Early Childhood, as well as a contributing author to an upcoming book around math and PBL. Um, and uh, as Rachel said, I, you can find me at my website or also our website, earlychildhoodpbl.com or on Twitter. Um, and um, it's wonderful to be here. So uh, before I started, I just wanted to say why uh, I was asked to do this presentation on math and disability and disrupting deficit notions that um, govern sort of how we teach math to students with disabilities. And I immediately wanted to ask Sarah to present with me. Now, Sarah was actually my uh, youngest child's kindergarten teacher. He's now going into his sixth grade. And she taught him how to read and she taught him a whole bunch of things. But she also, I could spend a lot of time in her classroom. And I was always amazed at how inclusive it was and how powerful the learning was that um, was very project centered, very authentic. So we collaborated a lot on mathematics instruction. And so I wanted to bring her into this conversation to give you a real life example of a beautiful inclusive classroom in action. So uh, before I tell you a little bit about the agenda, I want you to look at this image. This picture I took in the Starbucks um, that I used to go to all the time near my house. Uh, and I wonder what you wonder about it. What do you notice and wonder about this image? Um, when I've showed this to teachers in the past, they notice that, that there is a tiny icon of a person in a wheelchair. It's off to the side. It's not near the center. It's like way, way off to the side, right? It's also much smaller. It looks like it might be a child, especially compared to the other people in this image. So it makes us sort of wonder about the place of disability. Um, why is it to the side? Why is it a child? Um, why is it so peripheral to what seems to be the real work of this restroom, right? Which is these uh, large size adult woman and adult man. Um, now this can make you think about bathrooms. Every time you go around the world, you're gonna see how disability is represented in bathrooms and I'm obsessed with it. So you can send me photographs if you want. But here we're using it as an example of where disability is often placed in our society to the side. And the same thing happens in our schools, right? So today we're gonna start 
thinking about disability really broadly before we start talking about disability in math. What is disability? How is it perceived? And how do those perceptions matter in math education? That's where we're going to start. Then we're going to think about deficit thinking, sort of this out on the outskirts sort of idea of where disability belongs. Um, how does it influence what we think young children are capable of in mathematics? And we're going to disrupt in that some, some of these ideas about high kids and low kids and what kind of mathematics those kids need and deserve. Um, and then we're going to think about putting it into action. So how do we maximize access for students with disabilities to a meaningful mathematics, to real sense making? I'm going to present a framework called Universal Design for Learning and Mathematics. And um, then Sarah is going to take that framework and talk about how she uses project-based learning in her classroom and how that connects with universal design for learning. So very broad theoretical sort of start to our morning. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty with Sarah, where she's going to share like exactly what she does in her classroom, which is really, really amazing. So we start here with a different bathroom image I found. And here, disability is more central. And that's where we're going to begin. And that's what, oh, where we really, really want to place value in um, schools and systems and societies that don't see disability as, ex as separate, but see it as central to a community, right? To who we are as people. Um, I'm gonna talk a, a, a little bit in the beginning here about um, learning from insider perspectives. So insider perspective on disability is basically learning from people who are the real experts, which are people with disabilities, right? Um, not necessarily a professor like myself, even though I know a lot about disability and I've grown up around disability. The people who really know the most about it are those who understand the experience deeply. And that's what I draw on in all of my work. Um, I work in the vein of the disability rights movement of the disability justice movement. And, um, and so we really begin with the voice of people with disabilities. Um, this hashtag say the word is something that's been sort of trending on Twitter for a while, which is um, a call for many people with disabilities, not to use euphemisms like special needs or exceptional children, but to just say disability. Now, not everybody with disability agrees with that. The deaf community, for example, doesn't see itself as a community of people with disabilities, but as a linguistic minority. Um, but in general, disability is a beautiful word. It is, it honors the experience of many people. And so that's what I use. I also wanted to say one thing about identity first and person first language. Uh, in some disability communities, they prefer person first language, so a person with a disability. In others, they prefer identity first language um, instead of a person with autism, an autistic person or an aut So I'm gonna be going back and forth and trying to honor the language that people like. Uh, so let's go a little deeper into disability. Sometimes we think of it in really simplistic ways as teachers. We think of a wheelchair user or we think of students with autism. We might have more of those in our classrooms. But disability is really broad. It's really complex. All of these categories are part of disability. Disability is the only minority group that most people join in their lives. It's incredibly broad. It has an incredible amount of diversity within all of these categories. And of course, any individual person could have multiple, could identify with multiple categories. You could have autism and be blind. You could be dyslexic and have anxiety. And actually those interconnections are really common. Some of us go in and out of these categories during our lives. There's times where we have depression and there's times when we don't, right? But disability is very complex and multi-layered. Um, and also every single individual with a disability. So if we think about autism, that's which is what we're gonna talk about today, focus on autism, because that's the child that uh, Sarah is gonna share about in her classroom. Autism is incredibly complex because each person with autism is also uh, identifies with genders, identifies with race, identifies that as a certain age, a very young child or an older person. So there's a complexity across disability that we wanna always honor as we talk about it. Um, that complexity matters in pedagogy. Here, Michael Schuyler, who is a, a scholar in deaf pedagogy, this is a tweet that he wrote. Um, the only constant rule across deaf individuals, deaf subpopulations and the entire deaf population is heterogeneity. And he says, and I believe this is true for any of these disability sets, that teachers of people with disabilities need to have extremely large pedagogical toolkits, things that you can apply flexibly. There's no one answer that's gonna, help, that's gonna uh, serve the needs of the complexity of people with disabilities, students with disabilities. 
Today, we're going to go into neurodiversity, and that means that the um, cognitive difference is the primary difference for a person with neurodiversity, right? We're going to look at autism specifically. So the lens that we're going to use to talk about autism is something called neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is both a biological fact. Neurological diversity is part of humanity. Um, our brains are all different. Genetically, they're different. And our experience shapes and changes them. So that, that makes difference and variability across our brains, right? That's basically a scientific fact. Secondly, however, neurodiversity is both that sort of fact and it's a social justice movement. It's a social justice movement that was created by autistic self-advocates. So it was actually created in the autistic community, uh, this idea, the name neurodiversity and this idea. And it was a pushback from a, like a very prevalent idea that autism was something to feel sad about. It was something to feel pity towards a person. It was something that they suffer from. Um, and people with autism were saying, yeah, there's challenges to autism for sure. At the same time, there are strengths, there's beauty in it. There's things that I wouldn't trade for the world. So a really good example of it is Greta Thunberg, who you see at the top, who I think is, I don't know right now, she's, she's an inspiration to me. But she talks about the challenges that autism has given her. But at the same time, she also talks about the fact that she wouldn't be an advocate across the globe for climate change without autism, because it gave her focus, it gave her passion, it gave her direction, and it gave her almost a single-mindedness that allowed her to be the kind of advocate that she is. So neurodiversity can be applied to dyslexia, it can be applied to intellectual disabilities, but um, it began in the autistic community and it's very strong there. I also have here a couple of uh, memoirs, which I really encourage you to learn more about autism or any other disability category from the insider perspective. So learn about it from people who've experienced it. And there's a resource list that Sarah and I've created and we have links to everything here. So any Twitter person that I, that I mention or like flip by, you can find their Twitter handle there. You can find more information about these books so that you can um, sort of dive in and learn more about it. So another, another reason to use Twitter is to learn more about disability, again, from an insider perspective, but from perspectives that aren't talked about enough. On that last page, every single memoir that I showed you was not written by a white male with autism. Um, I think uh, too often we assume that autism is a category for white males. However, autism is across all countries in the world and it is across all populations. And I think as teachers, we don't know enough about how it feels to say be black and have autism. Here I have a couple of people that you can follow to learn more about the experience of being a black mother with a child with autism, a boy, or to learn what it feels like to be a woman with autism and ADHD who is also black. And that what things, um, what kinds of experiences in schools matter and how we can learn more about how they learn and experience the world to be better teachers. So think we want to define autism, which is the one we're focusing on today from an insider perspective. This organization, ASAN, and there's a link to it in the resources. This is an amazing organization that is founded and run by people with autism. They have a way of defining autism that's written here, um, starting with different sensory experiences, non-standard ways of learning and approaching problem solving, deeply focused thinking and passionate interests in specific subjects. There's, there's more, but what I love about this definition is it doesn't come from the DSM, it doesn't come from an outsider perspective, but it comes from people who really know what it feels like to have autism. So let's think about that in math. Um, these first three cognitive differences, we have different sensory experiences, different way of experiencing like your senses, light, sound, right? Non-standard ways of learning and approaching problem solving, deeply focused thinking and passionate interests. I want you to think for a second how these cognitive differences might matter in math class in early childhood. So now to sort of add some complexity to what you're thinking about, I'm, here is a little snippet of a memoir written by Don Prince Hughes, who uh, identifies as having autism and wrote Songs of the Gorilla Nation. She's a scientist with autism and it's an amazing book. Um, she wrote about herself as a child. I count numbers in my head or curl my toes over and over when I'm talking to someone. 
I get a physical thrill when I encounter symmetry. I love the lines and color of tennis courts and love to run on them. I love driving through tunnels and being surrounded by their roundness. So how might these cognitive differences matter in math class? I know because I'm talking to an audience of early childhood educators, your minds are racing because I know you think deeply about what children bring and how you can leverage the kind of strengths and, and ideas that they have. So if you have a child coming in to your classroom, Dawn Prince Hughes was, um, had a lot of difficulty communicating when she was in school, especially in the early years. Um, she had difficulty, difficulty following rules because they didn't always make sense to her or she had some sensory feelings that made kind of overwhelmed her. But her connection to mathematics, to symmetry, right? What a point to leverage. So in terms of math and autism, when there's a misconception that, um, and I think it comes from Rain Man, it comes from um, other television shows that students with autism have like a natural gift for mathematics. That's true for some people with autism, but in general, the, um, if you look at the average of people with autism, they're significantly underperforming in mathematics um, and underperforming other disability categories like learning disabilities or dyslexia, dyscalculia. The achievement for kids with autism in math is really variable. There are kids where it is a very, it's a strength for sure. And there are kids that it's something that they have a lot of learning left to do. Um, so it's also true that in certain STEM fields, there's a higher percentage of people with autism or people with autism are more likely to major in certain STEM fields. However, the biggest problem here and this sort of long-term problem I want us to think about is far fewer people with autism go to college than uh, their typically developing peers and than people with other disabilities. So the problem is access. There are some people with autism who are doing amazing in math, but there is so much more to grow. There's so much more we can improve about math education to support all kids with autism. So now we've talked about what is disability? How is it perceived? We've talked a little bit about deficit thinking, but actually I focused way more on non-deficit thinking, strengths-based learning, which I know will really resonate with an early childhood audience. But now how does this affect a math classroom? So what is really unfortunate is that we as teachers tend to sort of lump our kids into big groups. And a big group that Sarah and I hear about a lot is sort of the low kids, and the high kids. In math especially, like math somehow draws out this ability, this desire for us to rank kids. Um, low kids, IEP kids, sped kiddos, that is, a, I don't know, but uh, because sped is an insult where I grew up on the East Coast. And yeah, here in California, I hear people using it all the time as, an acro as a word, like sped. And every time I hear it, I kind of cringe. Uh, you've got high kids, the high flyers. So why do we create these groups? And what do they matter in terms of how we educate kids in terms of our math pedagogy? And before I go on, I just want to say my research on kids' perspectives on their classrooms, on math learning, and particularly kids of color with disabilities, that's who I uh, interview, I hear again and again how they know how they're being named and they use it to make sense of themselves. They know what group they're put in. They use it to make sense of themselves. A girl who was put in a group that was had three groups and there was a middle group. At the end of the year, I asked her what kind of math learner she was and she said, oh, I'm a middle because that's the group she was placed in. And she knew that and that's what she used to make sense of herself. So the first thing is to remember however we name kids, however we place them in groups, whatever we do, they use that to make sense of themselves. And we have to be really careful about the messages we give them about their own competence. However, we want to talk a little bit different, not just about how they take up these messages, but what they matter for our teaching. So here's the sentence I think kind of really is really important to consider. My high kids need what in math? How would you, how would people around you, teachers around you answer that? How they fill in that blank? Here's some of the things I've heard. My high kids need enrichment. They need a challenge. They need critical thinking. They need authentic learning, right? Definitely heard that. Like, I, I need to be providing that more for my high kids. But what about the low kids, right, who are too often include students with disabilities who are just lumped into that category, right? What kinds of math do they need? I hear that those kids need remediation instead of enrichment. They need procedures instead of challenge. They need to work on recall instead of these higher level critical thinking, that they need to master their basics before they get involved in a project. 
This, that we need to front load information to help them do well in a project. This is sort of the mythology that the whole rest of this presentation is going to be dispelling and helping us move beyond. Not just what I'm going to present, but also what Sarah is going to present. So I do not believe that this is true. I believe that all kids need this kind of enrichment, this critical thinking, and authentic learning. And that we need to find a way to integrate the kind of skill development kids need into that beautiful, like project-based, uh, problem-solving work, right? Sense-making in mathematics. All kids can do it. All kids deserve it. So why don't we give that to students who we call low kids? So we're going to break down some of these myths. First, the idea that individual development and neurology are far more complex than high-low. So why are we even using these terms? That high and low are based on a misconception about math and a misconception about mathematical development. We're going to smash them. That's my hammer for smashing them. Smash. Um, so first, individual development and neurology are far more complex than high-low. If you think about high-low in math, does that make a lot of sense? Well, no, because our brains are growing and shifting all the time because development itself is messy and nonlinear. There's multiple routes to growth. Growth. So um, in this book by Todd Rose, The End of Average, he uh, reports on a research they did on how kids learn how to walk. And they found that there were 25 pathways that all led successfully to walking. Um, and that's sort of funny. As a parent, I feel like I was told, well, they're usually probably going to do this and maybe they'll do that. But no, 25 pathways that led successfully to walking. I wonder how that matters in mathematics. And that individuals have unique sets of strengths and weaknesses. They have jagged learning profiles. In, in math, there's a lot of skills that matter. And each individual kid will have some parts of mathematics that they have an affinity for and other parts that they need more support in, right? Each individual has ways in which they are low and high in mathematics. So it also is based on a myth about what math is. Um, so Sunil Singh, who's on Twitter, also has given us these images to help us think about what K-12 to math is like. This idea of math as a ladder, you start here and you go up, right? You have to do the bottom before you get to the top. This creates ideas and mythologies that there are high kids and low kids. But he proposes that K-12 math should look like this, this beautiful Escher drawing where we see all of these interconnections, where math topics um, connect in interesting ways, right? Well, I think early childhood teachers have a, the strongest understanding of this of any group of teachers that I work with, because you understand how kids can have strengths in geometry and maybe need a little more help in counting, right? But math is complicated. And then it's also myths about mathematical development, myths that we have to move forward. You have to master the basics before you can move on in mathematics. In actuality, in terms of research, it's more complicated than that. There's multiple routes to multiplication, for example. And if we think about autism, for example, non-standard ways of learning, non-standard ways of problem solving, it is, happens uh, all the time. I hear stories about uh, students with autism who are learning things in unusual ways. So for example, the other day I was working with teachers and this teach, third grade teacher said, I have this child, he uh, mystifies me, he can do double digit multiplication with meaning. And he cannot count objects with one-to-one -one correspondence. And he's in third grade. That kind of um, the easy things are hard and the hard things, sometimes when you're passionate about them, you can do them amazingly well. Is it not uncommon story in autism all the time? In fact, there's a Twitter thread that's just started a couple of days ago, which was about what can you, it was actually asking people who are autistic, what can you do really, really well that's really, really hard? And what simple thing can you still have trouble with? And like tying shoes was an example. So we need to not make people be able to do the basics before they get to move on to the more complicated and beautiful part of mathematics. So this matters in math class because we need to smash this idea that these kids need this and these kids need that. All kids need and deserve enrichment, challenge, critical thinking, authentic projects, and we need to integrate skill development into all of them. So we're going to talk now about universal design for learning, and then Sarah's going to talk about project-based math. So universal design is where universal design for learning comes from. And it was invented by this person, Ronald Mace, who's an architect uh, with a disability who created this idea. Projects, buildings, and spaces should work for all people. Designs become better through including all users. And then we should begin by understanding the experience from a, a disabled user perspective, like empathy interviews. So you can't design something for someone if you don't understand their experience. 
So for example, let's look at this beautiful potato peeler. I'm sure you have this like way back in the edge of your like drawer. Um, because this potato peeler, it's effective, but it's actually hard to hold. It's hard to hold for long periods of time. So the people at OXO, this was a, a nice and fam kind of famous example of product design, interviewed a whole bunch of people and found out that for people who have low muscle tone, it was really hard to hold the original potato peeler. So they created this soft grip one that has like some grip holds and it's like bigger and you can squeeze it. So that works better for people with low muscle tone, but it also works better for kids. So my kids can peel potatoes. You see how I have benefited from this universal design. So through interviews, through really understanding the experience and perspective, of users with disabilities, that's how you can design products that are gonna actually work. So let's apply that to classrooms. Here we have a classroom with kids. This is actually from the 20s. I just like old pictures of classrooms, but the kids are sitting in rows and they're all, you know, have their hands folded like this. Um, how do we make that kind of classroom? It's not gonna work for all kids, right? How can we make classrooms work for a wider range of kids? So we need to, first of all, assume that all kids belong in all classrooms and they should, it should work. Curriculum that we use should work for a wide variety of kids, all kids. And that classrooms will become better by including all users. If we make changes for a classroom to include kids with disabilities, those classrooms will become better, richer, more accessible for everybody. And that we need to begin by understanding the experience from the point of view of children with disabilities. So that idea of empathy interviews beginning from the insider experience is super important for you as a teacher, as a designer. And the idea of UDL, the design is there for a reason. Teachers are designers. Teachers need to design spaces, interactions that work for all kids. And that these, when we think about curriculum, we need to make sure that the, the curriculum is designed around the children and it's not a curriculum that we're handed and then we got to force kids into it. So CAST is the organization that has a really like robust theory of universal design for learning. And they talk about barriers for learning that are not inherently within the capacity of the learner. So it's not a deficit model that the child lacks something. Barriers to learning arise when we give the inflexible educational goals, curriculum. When there's a lack of flexibility in the classroom, it's very difficult for all kids to be included. So UDL is based on two major research traditions. One is neuroscience. So the idea of learner variability, uh, that all of us in, interact with the world in different ways. And that there's three interconnected brain networks. There's the why of learning. There's, there's our, just, we need to be engaged to learn. The what, we need to actually recognize what we see and what we hear um, and what we touch and make sense of that information to learn it. And then lastly, we need to become strategic. We need to use our prefrontal cortex and begin to make sense of the world, interact with it, and then develop strategic like ways of being in the world. So the, all those three sort of dimensions of learning work together and we need to design things that engage kids in all those ways. Learner variability, sometimes I think people think of learner variability as like in, in sort of a narrow way. I want you to think about it really broadly. Kids in your classroom vary in how they see. They vary in how they hear, move, listen, speak. How, how they pay attention, not just how well, how they pay attention, what they need to be doing when they pay attention. Their memory, and kids have different memories for facts and procedures and for concepts, and they'll have different strengths and weaknesses, right? They have different variability in how they respond to uncertainty and manage stress. And so we need to think about our classroom in this sort of very broad and complex way to be able to plan and design for them. The second thing UDL is based on is the learning sciences. So in the learning sciences, we learn through doing. Um, this image here is called How People Learn Too. It's a very influential report that sort of summarized tons of decades of research on how we learn through doing, we learn through authentic rich tasks, we learn in community, we learn through discussion, and we learn through reflection. So you can probably hear in that that's really connected to constructivist, sociocultural, and developing like sociopolitical lenses on how we learn. We learn in context, learning is political, and we learn in discussion and through tasks, right? So that's why uh, UDL seems so similar to frameworks like project-based learning, to constructivism, to CGI. They're all connected because they're actually built on the same like research foundation. For UDL, because of this idea that we learn through doing and we learn through engaging in a practice, the goal that I put forward for UDL in math is the following, strategic sense makers in mathematics. This is the goal. The goal is not 
Each individual kid needs to become a master memorizer or learn all the procedures or even learn every content standard. I think the biggest goal we need to keep in mind is that we want to make sure our kids are strategic sense makers so that they make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Standard for mathematical practice one and the sort of overarching goal for a disposition we want to build in children. So all kids need and deserve enrichment, challenge, critical thinking, authentic projects with integrated skill development, right? In how does this matter in math specifically? Well, in engagement, we need to make sure that there's math classrooms in which kids feel safe sharing. They feel safe, especially taking risks. They're not gonna learn more in mathematics and they're not gonna like develop this disposition as a sense maker unless they feel safe saying something that might be wrong. Um, in my interviews with kids all the time, they're always telling me, they identify which classrooms they feel safe making mistakes in and which one they don't. And it always emerges even if I don't ask about it. So it's a very important feature for kids, whether they feel safe engaging. The second representation is in terms of mathematics in early childhood, I think the most important thing to remember is that learning needs to be multimodal. So kids can't learn math concepts just by using worksheets, right? They can't learn also probably just by using manipulatives. They need to see representations of number connected to their building number, connected to measurement. They need to see number and space and all their learning mathematically from multiple modalities. And secondly, they need to be able to make their own choices about what modalities to use to express their thinking. So it's uh, we need to make sure they have space to draw, to tally, to uh, write equations, to use manipulatives. Whatever makes sense in their minds is how they need to represent the information. And they can develop you know, more sophistication with other representations as they get older. But that primary, when they're learning something new, they need to choose how they represent it. And then lastly, action and expression. So that's developing strategic thinking, the way I'm thinking about it for math. And I think the most important thing to take away is that kids need to develop understanding of themselves as math learners. What am I great at in math? What am I working on in math? What do I do when I'm stuck in a problem? How can I get help? Do I ask a friend? These kinds of me like metacognition are what we really need to develop for kids to help all kids be successful. If you're interested in this, there is on the resource list, there's a really short paper that I wrote about UDL in math classrooms, and I think that you would love that. Well, uh, you know, maybe, uh, but it's there and it has more information about UDL in math. And now I want us to think about a, an amazing example from my colleague, Sarah Lev, um, how she did this with an actual child in her classroom. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so um, yeah, just to return, you know, when Rachel first approached me to join her for this talk, my first response was, um, well, I'd certainly heard about UDL. Um, it was not my expertise. I worked as an early childhood teacher and throughout the course of my teaching career, um, I've used project-based learning as an instructional approach. Um, but as we talked, I realized that project-based learning or PBL um, and UDL intersect in such beautiful ways. Um, they're so well aligned. Um, so it really made sense to, to partner with her here um, because really project work provides access and engagement in these really important ways um, to children, for all children and children with disabilities. And so um, just a little bit more about me. Um, I just finished my 15th year in the classroom um, in TK. So, and I've always used project-based learning in my instruction. Um, I really believe it empowers young children to become independent learners, to become, to really um, become critical thinkers and to, to, to empower them in, in all these amazing ways to collaborate with one another. And the focus of my work is really to work with early childhood teachers and school leaders um, to give them the tools and the strategies to do this work in, in classrooms. And I wanna give you a little bit of context um, around my own classroom that I just, I just finished the year. Um, I teach transitional kindergarten or TK, so that's four and five year olds. And I do three PBL units per year. So three projects per year. I have, I had 18 students and a really diverse group of children. Um, 11 of the 18 were English language learners. Um, two of my students came into TK with um, IEPs for autism and one for speech and language. And then throughout over the course of the year, another student um, received an IEP for speech and language as well. 
So um, often teachers have varied understandings of project-based learning, and I'm guessing there's a wide range of knowledge and experience with PBL here today. So I just want to give you a quick overview of what PBL is and what it sort of isn't. Um, and um, a lot of times teachers ask me about PBL, they have some assumptions that it's very open-ended and unstructured. Like um, we just follow the kids lead or we just go with their questions or we go with what they're interested in and not much in the way of standards, not much in the way of assessments um, that, are, that are high quality. Um, so I want to dispel those assumptions and give you a, a, just a quick overview of a framework that was created by the Buck Institute for Education or PBL works now. Um, really quick overview because um, there's so much wonderful, um, so many wonderful resources from PBL works about this gold standard PBL framework. Um, so, and those are in the resource list that I provided, that we provided. So project-based learning is a pedagogical approach, right? Students actively construct their own knowledge over a sustained period of time. Um, they collaborate with peers and they develop a public product that answers a driving question. And the framework that PBL Works um, puts out, this gold standard, is comprised of two parts. So the first part, that orangish red, um, is the are the seven essential um, design elements. So that I think of that as the what, right? What makes up a high quality project? And then the bluish green are the teaching practices. And I think about that as the how, how am I gonna implement this amazing project that I've developed and that I've designed? And these are really based in you know, learner-centered practi practices, constructivism. Um, it's really important to, um, to hold both those things together as we think about what project-based learning is. Now, just to compare it to what PBL is not, um, because many people tell us, you know, tell me they do projects, right? They do projects and they might do projects that um, are hands-on, right? They're hands-on projects. Um, there might be fun. They might be engaging for kids, um, but they are not project-based learning. And one of the key differences, there's a few key differences. Um, doing a project is typically, right, like a one-off activity, it usually takes place at the end of a unit. Um, it's usually an add-on to traditional instruction, um, and it's usually kind of like a showcase or uh, focuses um, or put out at the end of a unit. It could be a poster or a diorama, um, maybe a board game, right? Typically, it's not associated with the standards and the content and skills, and typically, that project remains in the world of school, right? Maybe you invite another class to see um, the dioramas or maybe some parents, but it doesn't really leave the classroom, right? It doesn't go into the public. Um, also, doing a project can be done alone, right? Kids can do it at home, right? They can buy a kit at Michael's to make a mission, right? Or they can... Um, they can do it at school independently, but project-based learning requires collaboration. It requires teacher guidance. So those are some, some key differences. Now, PBL, again, these are authentic learning experiences where content and skills are integrated into the project, meaning the project is the unit. And the public product um, that students are working on throughout that unit, through over the course of that unit, um, is it has relevancy beyond the classroom, right? So that integration of skills and concepts that are required for PBL are really key to going deeper. Um, and it's really applicable when you're talking about students with disabilities and in particular, uh, learning mathematics. So drawing on that PBL Works framework that we just shared, that I just shared, and bringing the notion of learner-centered practices and collaboration, we want to really um, bring to life the, the connection between UDL and PBL. So I want to share this list of elements. Some are from the PBL Works framework. Um, I added learner-centered, um, collaboration, and I want to just give you a minute to look through this list. These are really important skills that are aligned between PBL and UDL. So go ahead and read this list. So as you read um, and as you think about this list, I want you to think about what you're already doing in your classrooms. 
because most likely you are doing these things to some degree. And if you want to um, make improvements or adjustments in your practice, you want to be able to identify those strengths you have and leverage them and build upon them. So now I want to look at how the experience of project work um, across the year really uh, draws on kids' strengths, right, and allows them to work on their challenges and build knowledge and skills within the context of a project. And I love that Escher drawing that Rachel shared because that's a, a very much how I think about um, my students learning math, right? The kids might be anywhere in that landscape. They might be using their strengths and their interests to navigate this kind of maze of learning and, and build skills successfully. So as we um, go through some of the projects I'm gonna share, I wanna introduce you to one of my students. His name is Trayson. Um, and over the course of um, what I've shared today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about how he engaged in our project work over the course of the year. So just a little bit about him. He's six years old. Um, he actually just finished his second year in TK. He spent two years in TK. And when I approached his mom to ask her if it was okay to share his story today, she told me um, he identifies as multiracial. So he's uh, black, Asian, and white, and he has an IEP for autism. Um, and some of Trayson's strengths are he loves dancing, he loves dramatic play, he loves books and storytelling. He could listen to books over and over and over again. Um, he's very, very social. And some of the challenges that he, um, that he faced in school were around oral communication, um, graphomotor and fine motor skills, um, as, and gross motor skills as well, and, some, and number sense. And when he began TK, that would be in 2018, in terms of counting and number sense, he was counting to three. Um, he didn't yet demonstrate one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and then he had a lot of challenges around social interaction and engagement. Um, he kind of kept to himself. And as Rachel mentioned earlier, you know, one of the challenges I hear so often is about like my low kids, right? What they can handle, what kids with disabilities can handle in terms of project work. And we hear this with ch young children in general, right? This idea of, um, well, they might be too young. So we're really going to take a look at that. But specifically, the students with disabilities, that they need some kind of different learning. Um, they might need, you know, more rote memorization, more drill and kill, more simplified math learning. Um, but actually, this is not true. So what is true? Right? We saw this with when Rachel described UDL. In order to make strategic sense makers in mathematics, they need to learn through doing, right? They learn through authentic, rich tasks. They learn in community, right, through discussion. And we learn through voice and choice, giving, giving opportunities for reflection and voice and choice. And I might argue that this isn't just true for children and not just true for math, right? My guess is that if you think right now about something you've learned to do recently, my guess is that you learn in this way too. And these elements are all key parts of project-based learning and authentic um, experiences in the classroom. So this idea of strategic sense-making, right? This idea of, of how kids get there um, happens through project work. And um, it begins with, as a teacher, me planning and designing a project and then following through, right, that, that what, and then following through on how I'm gonna implement this in really um, purposeful ways. So I wanna talk you through that process, the planning and implementation process um, in terms of just one important area, which is content integration. So we often think that for young children, especially with, in terms of thinking about project-based learning or project work, content needs to be front-loaded, right? Okay, well, if they're gonna do this project, I better teach them this whole set of skills first, and then we can do the project, right? But actually, the most meaningful learning experiences happen when you are embedding or integrating these skills and dispositions and knowledge into the context of a project. And for students with disabilities, this contextualizing of math skills and concepts provides even greater access and opportunities to learning um, in community with others. So let's see what this looks like in practice in my classroom. So as I mentioned, I do um, three project-based learning units per year. They, they each last between eight and 10 weeks. 
Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about each project with you. Um, the first project is called the TK Butterfly Bakery. That was in the fall. Then the recess path, which was the spring. And then our third project was called Home Base, which was a remote, um, remote learning project because we were at home. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how Trayson engaged in these three projects. So just a note about um, how projects are designed. All projects begin with specific learning goals or standards at the center of the project, right? I usually start with, um, as a, in an early childhood context, I mean, I usually start with social studies and science, so you, you don't have to do that as my core. And then I build out authentic integration, um, like what makes sense in terms of math, in terms of social emotional skills, or what people call 21st century skills, right? Like critical thinking, um, problem solving those elements and certainly and literacy, of course. Um, and I really want to be intentional about what I'm integrating and why. So all projects have a driving question and that public product that, that goes beyond the classroom. Um, so let me walk you through these three projects and just highlight where the math integration took place and then how Trace and engaged. So as you listen to these examples, just think about what we talked about earlier. Think about not front loading, right? I didn't front load any content in any linear way. And then think about how the math is integrated into the project work context. So the first project that the Butterfly Bakery, the driving question was, how can we create and run our own bakery? And the public product was a, a student run bakery that was open to the community. So again, asking myself, what kinds of authentic math content and skills could be integrated. Well, we had to learn about counting. All of our bakery items were priced at um, 10 cents or less. So we could count by pennies and dimes. Um, counting, addition and subtraction, right? Um, measurement and weight because people, the bakers had to cook different recipes. Um, and then number writing. The picture here is of their, um, some of the cards they were on the bakery like tables to show what they were selling and then the cost of each item. Um, Trayson decided he chose to be a baker. He, well, all the kids got to take on different jobs and they all had to learn all the skills, but then at the actual day of the bakery, Trayson was a chef. So he worked with money, he worked with counting, he worked with um, our cooking teacher to, um, to create recipes using um, measurement tools, um, cups and tablespoons and teaspoons. Um, and then we went to do some field work in a bakery and he got to cook some, um, some tarts in different shapes. Our second project was the recess path. And the driving question was, how can we create a play path that kids can use when we have indoor recess? So this is, if you picture like a sensory path, when kids couldn't go outside to play, they wanted to get a movement, get movement breaks. So we designed a kind of portable uh, sensory path you could unroll um, and roll back up when we couldn't go outside. So that was the public product. Um, and it had different movements like bear walk and balancing walk. You see Sadie there, she's doing balance walk. And um, what did we use? What was the content and skills for math? Well, we had to measure the space where we were gonna put the paths. We learned about measurement. Um, we had to do some surveys and data collection to find out like what, kid, what kind of movements did kids wanna do? Like, would they rather do a frog jump or a bear walk? Um, and then a lot of counting and representation and cardinality. So here's a picture of Trayson. He's doing his surveys. Um, he was collecting and representing data, right? So asking his friends which movements they'd rather do. Um, and then of course, when we collected all our data, he worked on interpreting the graph, interpreting the data. Um, and he um, measured with unifix cubes and um, counted the space and represented that space. Our third project of the year was called Home Base. And this was when we were at home and um, our big problem was how could we create a set of activities for kids to do at home when grownups are working? Because all of a sudden we were all at home, parents needed to work and we needed to do something independently. So our public product was an online resource for families um, for activities that they could do independently at home. Um, now, um, one of the criteria of the activities that kids designed was that they had to last 30 minutes or longer. So the math that children had to learn had to do with time, understanding what 30 minutes was and felt like, um, and then the concept of greater than and less than and, and um, some number writing as they had to time their activities. Um, and so Trayson decided to build a fort 
Um, and he had to learn to time his activities. A lot of the questions, the kids had questions like, how do we know how long 30 minutes is? And how do we know if an activity is um, longer or shorter than 30 minutes? So we needed to build some knowledge around that. So this was a seesaw um, activity that he did with, with the support of a teacher in terms of understanding greater than and less than. And I, I'm not sure that if I mentioned this, but when, when Trayson started the second year of TK, he was counting up to seven. Um, and, um, and so this was towards the end of the year and you can see his growth in terms of understanding number and, um, and, and, and deeper concepts. So again, it was so important that in order to understand those concept contents and skills, um, Trayson needed to do this in the context of a project. And I was just thinking about how he grew over the course of the year as a mathematician. And this image um, came to me, I started to think about um, the day we measured our outdoor, uh, I mean, sorry, our hallway space to see where the recess path would fit. And this was like in end of February, or yeah, I think. And um, so remember, he was counting, was still working on counting past 10, right? And, and it was time to measure the space. And we all came out and Tracing came out too, right? And he seemed to understand that measuring does cover space right? He understood that conceptual idea. And he understood at the same time that there were many more numbers than he could count. But he was there with his peers while some of his friends were counting to 100. Some were counting by tens. Some were counting by five. Some were labeling the triple digits on the floor, right? Because this, this space went over way beyond 300. And he's still engaged, right? Um, at, at, in this project with his peers. And his conceptual understanding of mathematics really grew out of his engagement with this project, right? So there's this really important idea. Um, all kids deserve this, right? All kids deserve this type of learning and access um, with integration of skills. So how do we do this, right? How do we integrate this knowledge and skills into our projects work. And there are three ways that I do this. Um, and I call them layers of integration, right? And, and remember that teachers, as Rachel mentioned in UDL, were designers and were facilitators of learning. So it's really important for teachers to think intentionally about these opportunities for integration. So um, let me talk you through um, the first layer which I call intentional integration, right? Which is basically just what I've already described, right? Purposely choosing mathematical content and skills that naturally fit within the project goal. So for example, in the bakery project, I knew that bakers used weight and measurement. I knew that cashiers used money and counting. Those were intentionally woven into the project. The second um, layer of integration I call parallel integrations. I used to be a sign language interpreter and the sign for parallel is this, right? And I always think about that image of like, my project is here running, right? My, in the recess path, they are, they're needing to survey kids and ask them which movements they wanna do. But also running parallel to that is my unit, my standalone unit um, from Turk in investigations. I love their unit on surveys and data. So I'm doing that running parallel, right? A lot of teachers always ask me, well, if you do projects, is that like all day long you're doing projects? No, you still can have direct instruction. You still can have your um, standalone math time. And, 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 and oftentimes it really helps to reinforce these important skills and concepts that kids need to know for the project. Um, the other opportunity for integration in terms of a parallel is, is in, in counting collections and CGI story problems. So the, for us at the beginning of the year, um, we were doing the bakery and we were also doing counting collections. So I put different coin types in counting collections and the children were investigating and counting um, in meaningful ways. And then the other thing we did was CGI. You can do story problems about the context of the project, right? So like, um, you know, Rachel has... Uh, bought two chocolate chip cookies at our bakery, they each cost three cents, how much does she have to pay, right? Relevant, authentic integration. And then the final um, layer of integration I like to think about is spontaneous integration. And this is not so much planning, but being open to the natural connections that are gonna emerge either from you or from students, and then being open to lifting those up 
and drawing on them and building upon them. So for example, um, in our recess path, we interviewed our director of operations to find out what are the reasons that we have to stay inside for recess. And she actually was a former teacher and she brought in this beautiful chart that showed the heat index and the air quality index. And all of a sudden it was like, look at these number ranges from zero to 50 and 51 to 100. And all the kids got super excited about these numbers and temperature and they wanted to take the temperature every day, right? So, so spontaneous integration was me not saying, oh, we can't do that, that's not part of my project. It was about me going, there is really important math here and we are going to elevate that and build it into our learning. So just in closing, um, you know, I want to look, go back to this list, right? That list of, of elements that, authentic, uh, that connect UDL and PBL or project work. And you looked at this list and you thought, I'm already doing those things. I could build, about, build upon those things. So, so just remember that some is better than none, right? We often put so much pressure on ourselves to do everything as teachers, especially now. And just choose one or two areas that you could, that might potentially shift your practice in really meaningful ways. Because those changes that you make are gonna make a huge impact on your students and the community that you build in your classroom. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that story of stories. Um, I'm gonna sort of close us out by trying to bring together a bunch of the things that we talked about and sort of this summary slide. Uh, we started by thinking about how disability is often peripheral in schools and society put to the side and how we wanna make it central. We wanna make it central in our schools. We wanna make it central in our communities and we wanna make disability part of our classrooms in a way that honors and values disability um, instead of stigmatizes it. And I think that shift from deficit notions to asset-based notions is the most important shift we're gonna take to include kids in math instruction because all that beautiful work that Sarah is doing with, in her classroom, it comes fundamentally from her belief that her kids can all do it, right? So that's the most important shift we have to make. Um, we can do it by understanding more about it from the perspective of people with disabilities. So understanding neurodiversity because it comes from the autistic community, reading memoirs, finding insider perspectives, interviewing our kids, empathy interviews. That's how we're gonna learn much more meaningfully how, what our students need and want, more than listening to a lecture from me, more than reading a book. Learning from experts is the most important way to design your classroom. Um, we thought about how math is set up as a staircase and how that holds kids back and helps us create these false dichotomies of low and high. And instead mathematics is complex, right? And you see that, I kept thinking about that, like Sarah brought up when she was talking about how all the mathematics she was doing is all interwoven together, all for authentic purpose, but there's so much mathematics that's interconnected in each of her projects. So we're gonna smash this idea of low kids and high kids. We're gonna smash the idea that kids need different math. They don't, they all need to be engaged, right? Um, and we're gonna take the idea of a one size fits all classroom and we're gonna change it into the kind of classroom that Sarah was talking about. This, I love this image of all those images she showed, which I really, really love these pictures and I'm so grateful for her kids and for her for bringing it to us. But this picture of Trace and talking to friends about their survey and like getting in together. I mean, there's so much, you know, there's mathematics, there's social development, there is friendship development. Everything is interconnected and you can see a kid who's gonna do that. That kid is gonna emerge understanding himself as a person who can do mathematics, who has the disposition to really succeed and thrive, right? So someone who feels that they're engaged. I saw a lot of this in what Sarah was talking about. Everything was authentic. There was a reason to do it. You were learning counting because you're doing the bakery. It made sense. And that kind of contextual context is particularly important for kids who need more support to engage. For some kids, a worksheet is never, ever, ever gonna take them deeply into mathematics. They need to do it for a reason. They need to do it for a purpose. And that is what, what Sarah did really brings to kids, the purpose and the authenticity. Um, the second thing is that representation was 
throughout. So there's measuring with the cubes. There's number in so many different contexts. There was number in the like really big numbers on the cubes, for example, and their little labels. But then there's also numbers in that air quality index and then the temperature. And then they had another picture she didn't show. She's looking at the temperature, like the thermometer. So th they're thinking about number across representations, across modalities and making connections across that. And then the action and expression, the strategic development, that happens throughout the classroom as they have a goal, reach the goal, figure out what they need for the goal and together as a community learn, right? So we wanna make sure that number one, we believe that students with disabilities have far, far more strengths than our current system recognizes. The system, I didn't get into my critique of the system, but I think you probably know how it's set up in many ways to expect less of students with disabilities. So we have to develop our own understandings of disability, all of us. I'm always learning and always growing and learning from insider perspectives. We need to see barriers to instruction and to learn not within the child, not focus on what the child can't do, but focus on what are we doing to make sure this context works for all of our kids? How can I make this work better for that child? And then we need to maximize access for meaningful mathematics for students with disabilities. And if they do that, they will astound us. We didn't have time for questions, but I am very, very serious that if you tweet a question at me or at Sarah, we will answer it. And um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Okay.